morning, everyone, and it's a real privilege to speak to you today. And while I immensely value the way that technology has enabled us to communicate well over recent months, I very much look forward to being live in person with you very soon, just as I have in the past. The theme of today's event is revitalization, or to borrow the phrase of the chance of a few weeks ago, uh, a new chapter. But before I return to that subject, I'll start with a moment of reflection. I've been the Economic Secretary now for nearly three years. That might not sound very long, but believe me, it is elms in politics. A lot has happened since I started the job, both with the financial services sector and more widely. But over the past eight months, COVID-19 has transformed our lives. And I don't uh, underestimate for one moment the test of leadership this pandemic has presented to you all, the people at the helm of this vitally important industry. But you have risen to the challenge, and as the Chancellor said last week, the past months have shown your sector at its best. It's your industry that has safeguarded the savings and pensions of millions of people through the choppiest waters imaginable. It's your frontline workers in banks and call centres who have helped people access the vital financial services they need. And it's your sector that has helped the government swiftly and efficiently issue £60 billion pounds of loan payments that have helped keep, keep 1 billion businesses afloat. So thank you very much for everything you've done and that you continue to do. Uh, we are acutely aware of the disruption caused by the further restrictions that we recently had to introduce to combat the virus. And we're grateful for your patience and we'll be setting out further detail on our next steps as soon as possible. But I want to now turn to the future and look further ahead. And I'm particularly glad to speak to you today because this event is very timely. This moment as we come to the end of the transition period and begin our economic recovery from coronavirus. It marks the start of a new chapter for this country's financial services industry. And as the Chancellor said last week, we began that chapter by setting out the government's vision for the future of the sector. It's a vision of an open industry where British finance and expertise drives trade, com commerce and prosperity with partners in Europe and around the world. A technologically advanced industry that uses all its ingenuity and talent to deliver better outcomes for consumers and businesses. A greener industry that harnesses innovation and finance to tackle climate change and protect our environment. And above all, an industry that serves the people of this country, acting in the interests of communities and citizens creating jobs, supporting businesses, and driving growth as we direct all the strength of this country towards economic recovery. Needless to say, this vision will be based on world-beating regulation that is agile and responsive, along with safe and stable markets. Last week, I laid the legislative foundations of that vision with the Financial Services Bill. While the Chancellor announced a new policy in three areas that underpin our vision, openness, technology, and green finance. So I'll turn to those now in turn. So firstly, openness. Our approach is very simple. We want to welcome the, we want to become the most open and competitive financial services centre in the world. And our most urgent task right now is to give certainty in our approach to regulation. To achieve that, we need to decide on our approach to equivalence, and one of the central mechanisms for managing our cross-border financial services activity within the EU and beyond. And we continue to strongly believe that it is in the UK and the EU's mutual interest to reach a comprehensive set of decisions on mutual equivalence. As I think you all know, our ambition has been to manage these decisions cooperatively with the EU. However, it has become clearer 
that there are many areas where the EU is not prepared to even assess the union area in the short to medium term, despite having a wealth of information at its disposal. And we've no wish to politicise this situation, but we simply can't allow the uncertainty to run more on in turn. That's not good for you in industry or the economy as a whole. It's time for us to move forward and do what is right for the United Kingdom. And that's why last week we published a set of equivalents decisions for the EU and EEA and member states based on outcomes-based proportionate assessments. It's a step that should provide the certainty and stability to you as industry, as you need to deliver on the goal of open, well-regulated markets. We've taken a principled approach, aiming to be open, predictable and transparent as we've made those decisions. In addition, we've published a detailed framework for our general approach to equivalence, taking a technical, outcome-based approach which prioritises stability, openness and transparency. It's important too that our UK businesses benefit from a level playing field as far as possible. And as I'm sure you're aware, UK financial services businesses cannot currently reclaim input back on exports to the EU. So to make sure UK financial services exports to the EU remain competitive, we will treat them the same as exports to other countries. And this means that UK firms will be able to reclaim the input VAT on financial services exports to the EU. That's support worth £800 million per year. And just as we are focused on providing certainty to financial services after the transition period, we also want to help your industry sees new opportunities outside the EU. Earlier this year, we took a major step forward with our partnership with Switzerland. And while we recently had a productive economic and financial dialogue with India, and we hope to hold a dialogue with Brazil before the end of the year, we've also signed a trade deal with Japan that goes further than the EU's financial services deal that will take effect in January. And financial services are key features of talks with our other partners, such as the US, Singapore, Australia and New Zealand. In addition, last week we announced our intention to launch a call for evidence on our overseas regime. This will allow us uh, next year to tailor our approach to enable market access to investment funds from other countries and to build on the 113,000 jobs already supported by the asset management industry. We've also said that we are going to publish a consultation on reforming the UK investment funds regime. We've also heeded the investment industry's request that we make it easier to invest in longer term illiquid assets, such as infrastructure. And I know that this is an area of great interest to City UK. So I was delighted that last week we set out our ambition to have a long-term asset fund and have it up and running within a year. This won't just be good for savers and the industry, it will be good for the UK as a whole, boosting investment in the vital infrastructure that will support our economic recovery. While our investment industry is one of the jewels of our financial services sector, so is our thriving fintech industry, a sector that has generated 76,000 jobs right around the country. So let me turn to the next part of our vision of finance, is technology. We want to reach and fulfil our full potential in this area, and that's why we're looking forward to studying the recommendations of Ron Khalifa's independent review on how the UK can become the leading destination for starting up, growing and investing in fintech firms. In addition, we continue to take a leading role in the global conversation on central bank currencies, with the Treasury and the Bank of England considering whether and how central banks issue their own digital currencies. On that note, we're going to launch a consultation on our regulatory approach to stable coins. This will help us seize the opportunities of this emerging form of payment, but ensure it meets the same minimum standards as more traditional methods. While we're on that subject, 
We've all seen how digital and contactless payments are helping to keep the economy moving through the pandemic. And through our payments landscape review, we'll be considering the new challenges and risks that arise from this rapid switch to these new forms of payments. We do have some work to do on that front. So I'm delighted that we've received over 60 responses to the review to help inform our decisions. And we'll be setting out our next steps early next year in 2021. I'll now move on to the last area of uh, policy focus that I'd like to discuss today. Harnessing the power of financial services to tackle climate change. This is a real personal priority for, of mine. In fact, last time I spoke to you, I talked talk about the need to turn this challenge into a spur for technological, economic and social progress because we really do want to take a lead here. And that's why last year we launched the Green Finance Strategy to mobilise investment in green and resilient growth. And now as we prepare to host the COP26 UN Climate Conference next year and the G7 Conference, we have a real chance to shape the future agenda in this area. I'm also delighted that last week we announced our intention to introduce a mandatory task force on climate-related financial disclosure requirements across the economy by 2025, with a significant proportion of those requirements in place by 2023. This is a really significant moment. It makes this country the first to go beyond complying or explain, <clears throat> or as far as possible requirements. While the UK's TCFD Task Force Interim Report also published last week, sets out how we will meet this important commitment. We've also said we'll issue our first ever Green Sovereign Bond. And I know that's something that many of you have been calling for for some time. So I'm delighted to show you that we've made progress on this front. So these policies across these three themes begin a new chapter for financial services. And they're part of an ambitious programme of regulatory reform being undertaken by this government. Because now we've left the EU, we have the opportunity to take back control of decisions governing the sector and to be guided by what is right for the United Kingdom, to regulate differently and to regulate better. Now, as I mentioned earlier last week, the Financial Services Bill has its second reading in Parliament, marking the next stage of our reform agenda. The bill will deliver several existing government commitments and it will help ensure that the UK maintains its world-leading regulatory standards, as well as ensuring our openness with international markets. And we're also taking a fundamental review of our financial services regulatory framework. This will allow us to consider how we may need to change the way that we make and shape our future rules now that we've left the EU, while building on the strengths of our existing framework and on the role played by our independent financial service regulators. We're also carrying out a number of other reviews in areas that we know are priority for industry, including looking at Solvency 2 Directive, to make sure that it properly reflects the unique features of the UK insurance industry. Another issue that people have been uh, rightly at the at for for the last three years. So as you can see, we are at the start of a new chapter. And while all of this is going to keep myself and my team very busy here in the Treasury, it's not a job for us alone. It is going to take the collective efforts of us all. And I do really mean all of us, from the biggest bank to the smallest fintech startups in every part of the country. Indeed, as the Chancellor said last week, financial services are not synonymous with the City of London. And that's why over the coming weeks I'll be making a point of meeting those of you based outside of the camp as I know you are going to play a crucial role in realising our vision. I'll wind up my remarks by saying that I really do mean that it is a privilege to talk to you. And I very much look forward to working with you over the weeks and months ahead. So we together can make this next chapter for your sector even better than the one before. Thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to address you today.